Thanks very much, Brian. And can I, on behalf of the family, thank Brian and Porek for organizing this event. It's very nice to be commemorating not only your father, but a very famous Irishman. Uh, I would also like to congratulate Brian on, on the excellent book. I really enjoyed it and would recommend it strongly to you. What I am going to do in my short time is, I thought, having seen the still pictures of the man, you might like to see some movie, live pictures. And for this, I have uh, copied, uh, or Ian copied onto PowerPoint for me, uh, various clips from a program done by BBC Northern Ireland Television called The Heart of Matter. The commentator in that program was Al Byrne who uh, died a few years ago, he's uh, Gay Byrne's brother. So we'll start with the uh, first uh, clip. This is just by way of, of introduction. It takes a little second to get going. This is the profile of one man, still alive. This was about 25 years ago. He participated in an experiment in the cabinet that was the entree into an awesome new science, bringing with it a revolutionary source of power. That's, uh, as I said, about 25 years ago, so he would have been in his mid 80s uh, then. Next one shows him approaching the physics department in, in Trinity. About uh, writing to Lord Rutherford to try and get into the Cavendish. It was at a lower academic and its brightest students would look elsewhere to fulfill their gifts and pursue their ambitions. Morton graduated with first class honours set his sights on the famous Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge and his research team were led and inspired by one man, Ernest Rutherford. I wrote to Rutherford to ask him to admit me as a research student to the Cavendish and he wrote back a letter saying that the place was really full up, that it didn't really have any room for any more students, people were applying from all over the world. But he didn't say no in the letter. And sometimes he had a little bit of a for saying that he was admitted to the Cavendish laboratory. What he, what he didn't actually mention there, I think he was helped in his uh, ambition to get there by a Professor John Jolie from geology uh, in, in Trinity. He had done work on halos, uh, little halos in rocks which were created by alpha particles and had collaborated with uh, our known Lord, Lord Rutherford personally. So I think he probably put a good word in for him. Uh, the next uh, clip is uh, about him explaining the experiment to, to Al Byrne. Uh, I, in the interest of brevity, I omitted some of the early part of this which he, in which he explains what a proton is. And for those of you who don't know, if you take an atom of hydrogen and you remove the orbiting electron, you're left with a proton. This is in the uh, lecture, main lecture theatre, the Fitzgerald Lecture Theatre in the, in the physics department. Here we see the protons coming down and they speed it up as a result of applying the high voltage. They come down, strike lithium here, produce uh, two helium nuclei going in opposite directions. And this one coming out here strikes a fluorescent screen and where it hits it, a tiny flash of light is produced, which you can see by looking through this microscope. And here is the observer's eye. Here is the actual apparatus which we have. And uh, right at the top of it is where the protons were produced. By the way, that is the only original bit of his apparatus there. The, the big uh, stack 
beside it is is a voltage doubling circuit, but is not not the original one. But this this is bit. This is in the Science Museum in London. Um, by the, by the way, they were really working on a shoestring in the Cavendish Laboratory. They were very short of money and so and materials and whatnot and all sorts of. Wooden, wooden pieces of wood and rusty screws were all saved and used again and again. In fact, there's a story about uh, Lord Rutherford one day. He had some very VIP visitor in his office, and there was a knock on the door, and it was the chief technician. And Rutherford said, uh, what is it? Oh, sir, it, it's the bucket. And Rutherford, yes, well, what's about the bucket? It's got a hole in it. Well, said Rutherford, can't you mend it? Oh, he said, it's been mended about three times already. So I think he got the go-ahead to buy a new bucket, but that was the, the sort of thing that was going on. The next clip um, describes, uh, is, is himself uh, describing the events of the 14th of April. The next thing I did was to get out to Comcroft, who was doing some work with Gibbons at the time. And he came over and uh, satisfied himself that these were genuine uh, simulations by carrying out some experiments which I had carried out for myself previously before getting out to him. And uh, we both agreed that this was a genuine effect. So he got out to Rutherford and Rutherford came along uh, very quickly. He was always quickly on the spot if people were getting results. <laughs> and uh, we maneuvered him into the middle of the hut. He was a big man, uh, and uh, he got seated on the little stool and had a look at these scintillations. He didn't say anything at the time, and then he told us to shut down the whole apparatus. And he came out of the little hut and sat down on a laboratory stool, as his custom was when he wanted to talk. So he said something like this, those scintillations look mighty like alpha particle scintillations. And he went on to say that he had been in at the birth of the alpha particle, and he'd been following him ever since, and that he ought to know an alpha particle scintillation when he saw one. Well, this was very cheerful news to both of us to hear the word expert on alpha particles to, to vouch for the genuineness of these simulations which we had seen. Just one thing I, I might like to correct there, the pictures of the tracks, that, that came later. The, the actual, what they actually saw were little flashes of light on a screen looking at it through a microscope. Those were tracks that were recorded in what's called a Wilson cloud chamber sometime afterwards. Uh, I'd just like to point out that, that the, practically all the, the work in constructing the apparatus, uh, my father was excellent with his hands and he did the, most of the work of uh, assembling the, uh, the apparatus. Now, of course, as Brian has already mentioned, there was huge publicity uh, at the time and it, Brian already mentioned Dad used to say that he thought one of the reasons for the big publicity was that play that was on in London where this mad scientist had split the atom and he was holding the world to ransom. Uh, so um, this, this clip just shows you some of the publicity that followed Alchemist's Dream has come true. Normally, with a, a, a new scientific result, 
You notice there the energy without limit. Well, just to, to mention that, of course, it, uh, the splitting of the atom was only one step towards nuclear power and the other steps that had to take place. First of all, of course, the neutron had to be discovered, and that was done in the same year, 1932. And then you had to have nuclear fission, where a uranium atom can be split into two by bombarding it with a neutron, and then those neutrons go on and split others. So you could get a chain reaction going, and then the first demonstration of a chain reaction in the pile uh, by Fermi in the uh, University of, of Chicago. Uh, now, the actual award of the Nobel Prize is the next clip. Um, there was, before I show it, I just mentioned that, uh, of course, when the announcement was made, there was. Uh, uh, fated, uh, very much fated, and, and, and there was a special luncheon dinner in, in the Aris uh, President's uh, dinner. And when they got to the boat going to Sweden, they were shown the, the royal suite instead of the, what they had booked. Uh, we, the three of us, the, the three elder children, were at uh, their old school. Uh, in, my mother and father were head boy and head girl at the same time in the Methodist College Belfast. And anyway, uh, when the award was announced, the three, uh, Alan, Marion, and myself, were boarders at the Methodist College Belfast. And I got a phone call from my mother, and I was 11 years old at the time. He said, your father has been, uh, uh, received, uh, is to receive a very prestigious award, the Nobel Prize. And I said, you know, what's that? I mean, at 11, you wouldn't have heard of a Nobel Prize. But anyway, it was duly announced next day in, in the school assembly. And of course, uh, it, got, it, 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 it was announced by the headmaster. And uh, to, to uh, celebrate, we were given a half day off school. So, so I was rather proud. At least that was important for me. My dad got you a half day off school. But there was uh, a little boy went home. And his mother said to him, what are you doing home again today? You, you seem to be always getting half days in that school. What is it this time? Oh, I'm not sure. Somebody split something. That's <laughs> right, <laughs> oh, that's okay. Yeah, this, this is one of the press pictures, too, at the time. My younger sister, Jean, who is six years younger than I am, she was at home. The rest of us were away at school. So she got in all the newspapers, the photographs. These are the Nobel laureates proceeding down. This is the oration, I think. And that's, that's Cockroft beside ETS. That, uh, the Swedish Academy would decide on a certain Thursday to whom they make these awards for that year. So then next, next Thursday, we listen in on the, the BBC News and it was on the 6 o'clock news. And uh, the last clip I have, and it's not from this program, it's, uh, it's a clip of Einstein talking about relativity. 
And if you listen, it, it, this is not a very clear recording, and his accent, of course, is pretty heavy. But if you listen carefully, you, you'll hear nor, near, towards the end his mention of their experiment. It follows from the special theory of fallibility that mass and energy are good, are first different manifestations from that unfamiliar conception that the error is mass. Furthermore, the equation E is equal to mc squared, in which energy is first equal to mass multiplied with the square of the velocity of light, shows the very small amount of mass may be converted to the very large amount of energy and vice versa. The mass and energy were in fact equivalent. According to the formula mentioned above, this was demonstrated by Kopka and Boyden in 1932 experiment. And that's, and that's the end of the clips. And I want to just thank Ian, my son, for putting this together for me and being there in case it went wrong. So thank you very much.